Thank you so much for joining us today. Cool. Okay, so starting off, um, I'm Alexa. I'm the host here for Sneedcast. Um, thank you, Jeff from Cold Brew for joining us here on our little humble podcast. Um, we actually wanted to jump right in. Uh, so what is it that inspired Philip McCrory to create Cold Brew and how does his background influence the company's development? So back in, it was about 1987, mm-hmm. um, my father, Phil, my father, he, right. um, he started making Cool Brew in, his, in the kitchen. He started making it just, we always drank instant coffee and I just mm-hmm. thought that was great. And, and he started making this when one of his friends gave him a cold brew coffee maker that he bought at Whole Foods, I think. Um, Mm -hmm. He gave it to him and he started making it and experimenting with different blends of coffee. And we were all sitting around the kitchen table and some friends were over and he's like, you guys got to try this. It's really good and you're all tasting it. I said, man, this is great. Why didn't somebody put it in a bottle and sell this stuff? He says, that's a great idea. Let's do it. And next thing Mm -hmm. you know, um, I'm dropping out of college uh, as we're starting a starting a business. Um, so that was that's what you know it just kind of happened, right? It, was never, and then, it wasn't really planned or anything. Yeah, no, I was just about to ask. Was it surprising? Because I know that his background he was originally a pharmacist, correct? Right. Yeah, no. So I I can only imagine the the change from pharmacy to now um, cold coffee brewing. It was, um, uh, it just happened just organically. Um, right. You know. And, and then, actually, he so, never, he never really retired from being, being a pharmacist. He really? worked for the state, for Louisiana State Health Department um, until a week before he passed away. And that was about 12 years ago, I think. Okay. Interesting. And then something else. So while reading through um, Cool Brew's history, we came across the fact that your dad um, was ma- or was mining a wealth of information since New Orleans has such um, a rich coffee history and background. Um, how did this help him reinvent the 150-year-old cold brewing process? Um, well, it, it, you know, it's, it's funny how uh, in New Orleans, coffee has been part of the history of this um this city forever and it's you know they always call seattle the coffee capital but coffee really was a huge thing here and we um mm-hmm. we always blend chicory with the coffee because back um you know in, in the early days uh there was a there was a um uh, a tariff on bringing coffee in so in Louisiana, in New Orleans, uh, they started blending chicory with coffee, which that's a uh, that's the root of the endive uh, plant, which they use in salads. So they take the root and roast it, um, and blend that with the coffee now, and that's become a huge thing. So that's kind of where, um, you know, that's where we got the inspiration to do that. So all of our coffees have chicory blended in. Uh, which makes a lot uh, stronger cup, but it cuts down the amount of caffeine as well. Right. Um, And then something else that we actually wanted to touch on. So from the time that your dad started the company until now, um, that you and your brother have taken over or are now running it, what would you say are some of the most significant milestones, um, challenges, and triumphs that you guys have faced up to date? Um. Well, in in recent years, and mm-hmm. probably over the last ten years, uh, we've had a lot more requirements put um, with uh, with like the packaging and with uh, you know food safety uh, food safety mandates and things like that. Those have been real challenging. One thing that you know you guys. Have uh, helped out with is the packaging challenges that we've had. Um, some companies like Walmart specifically uh, mm-hmm. require us to put the date 
and code stamping on two spots on the bottle and on every side of the box. So when we're packaging, that was kind of a big challenge. And uh, that was great that we found speed coding to help um, by making, making it a lot easier and more affordable to be able to do that. Because we had these, uh, we had this equipment before where we had to take it apart, clean it every day, and um, it was a big mess. It was ink all over the floor. It was just a huge yeah. mess, and that was one of the great things that uh, that you know we were able to overcome. Right. So while reading your case study submission, I actually read the whole like disassembly and then cleaning process that you guys would have to do. What equipment yeah. were you guys using, if you don't mind me asking? You know, it's been a long time. I don't really, I don't even know the, the name of the, uh, it's been a long time since we had to use that, uh, but it was a, it was a nightmare and I, I, I sought out a better way. And I was, I was thinking every time I had ink all over my hands, there was ink all over the floor and it was a huge mess. And I was just right. kind of really distraught by the whole thing. Um, and then when we were, asked to be able to put the, the date on mm -hmm. two, two places on the package and then all around the whole box, I was thinking this is going to be a nightmare that we're going to have ink everywhere. So, um, yeah, I don't, I don't remember what the name of the, uh, the equipment was, but it was, uh, it wasn't good. Right. And then, so we work with a lot of small businesses and a lot of startups. We know that saving time is one of the biggest things that our customers are looking for. Um, yeah. Whenever you mention that you have to like take apart everything, clean it, how much time would you say that you're now saving that you have Sneed yet? Oh, that was, that was hours. It was hours because it was really, you had to take the whole, take everything apart and scrub mm -hmm. it with a brush and like, you know, right. then you had to, let everything dry and make sure it was clean and put it all back together. It's, you know, it's probably with all the different, with the packaging, um, I mean, with the, the bottling line and then also the box machine having to take apart three different uh, machines and clean okay. all of that. And then repairing it when, when something would break, because that would right. happen a lot too. But yeah, it saved hours of time. Yeah, no, now that you have so much free time on your hands, what would you say that you're now um, doing with it all? Like, are you able to now save manpower? Are you now able to have um, different team members working on more important aspects of the business? Um, how are you now using all of that free time? Um, well, if, yeah, we have, we've been able to save a lot of man hours. I mean, actually now we've, we've hired more people because our business is nice. expanding a lot more. Right. Um, we're in about uh, 2,500 stores right now. And then is that nationwide? Yeah, oh, okay. nationwide. Um, I think we're in like 30 states. Oh, nice. Congrats. Yeah. Um, okay, so another question we do have is, what strategies would you say that you guys have used to introduce and then popularize cold brew coffee concentrate um, in saturated or unfamiliar markets? Because obviously New Orleans has such a rich coffee history. Um, I'm sure that it wasn't new there, but how are you guys introducing it in so many different states? Well, it was, I mean, when we first started out, nobody had ever thought of uh, cold coffee before. And we, we, weren't mm -hmm. even, we weren't even promoting it as iced coffee. We were promoting it as a way to make hot coffee easily. Like, uh, you know, and it, a lot of people don't realize you can take cold brewed coffee and mm -hmm. add it with hot water and have hot coffee. That's just it's good. Um, right. But we're we're on. We do a lot of uh, store in store demos, um, and you know by promoting it with little um, with social media, little videos and things like that. Um, it's it's become a lot more popular all on its own thanks to. All the competition we have now um that's actually a really good thing because it's it's created a whole uh, a whole um you know a whole new market it's it's really kind of just happened organically um, right through word of mouth 
Yeah, no, I'm I'm sure it's great to be able to say that you guys were one of the originals out there compared to some of your competitors. We were the first um, bottled cold brew coffee. Nice, and, and, and then the, at least I know in this country. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, um, and then so sustainability. We talk about it a lot here on the show, and then as I was reading through your website, I know that you guys also. Um, do a big part in making sure that your business is as sustainable as possible. Um, what would you say are some of Cold Brew's uh, sustainable practices and how have they evolved over the years? Um, well, I mean, one of the, one of the big things we do, um, we work with a local, a local farm. Um, mm -hmm. they're, called, they're actually called local cooling farms. And they, right. um, they send a guy every week and they pick up about 20,000 pounds of used coffee grounds and bring them to their farm um, where they they spread it out in the fields and they're re um, they're re uh, I don't know what the proper term is but they're 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 re uh, generating the soil and okay. they actually they farm they farm chickens and the chickens like to eat the soldier fly larva that like for some reason these specific things like to uh, land in the used coffee grounds and the chickens eat that so they produce uh, organic chickens and eggs and they have little mm -hmm. stores that they sell it in but that's one of the big things that we're diverting all of those uh, spent coffee grounds from the landfill which normally that's where they would go uh, Right. But this, that's one of the big things we do. And, you know, smaller things we do here, recycling our cardboard and plastic waste and all of that stuff. Um, mm -hmm. And then another partnership that, that I, that I had read that you guys have is with Laughing Buddha Nursery, correct? Well, that's the same guy has that. Oh, okay, he's okay. got his farm and they have right. a nursery and a little organic store. It's kind of like a farmer's market store that mm -hmm. they sell all of their um sell all of their vegetables and right and then how did that partnership come into uh into play like whenever you guys were first looking for more um sustainable ways to use your used coffee grounds um originally we had a there was a guy that worked for a local for the uh parkway partners and he worked with the city here mm -hmm. and he would come and pick it up pick up the coffee grounds, and then it got to be way more than he could handle. Um, and this guy, uh, the guy with the, the Laughing Buddha Nursery, he came along and he asked if we could do that. And now we have an exclusive agreement with him. He kind of got oh, mad nice. when I gave some coffee grounds to somebody else. And he said, those are mine. We need to sign this contract. <laughs> it's okay. If you promise right. you're gonna pick them up every week. Cause it was costing us a lot of money to to, mm -hmm. to ship this stuff up we were filling up a dumpster and sending it off to the landfill because people you know people were picking up and they couldn't take as much as we had and so right. it just kind of he just came along he said i'll take all you have um it's just so long as you don't give it to somebody else so we have our little exclusive agreement and that mm -hmm. just that just happened all by itself it wasn't you know I was looking for a way to to work it all out, and it just came along. Right. I guess it was good. And then, yeah, no, it seems that everything just happened um, very organically for you guys. Yeah. Um, and then something else that I wanted to ask: What other ways would you say that you're promoting sustainability in your community? Um, we do. Uh, we work work with the. Uh, and we actually our neighbors across the street and the uh, uh, jewel solar energy and we work with them a lot uh they're going to be setting up solar panels on our roof um we do mm -hmm. all of our we changed all of our lighting in the building to led lighting so we're trying to uh, use a lot more renewable energy right and then, so something that we've learned while talking about sustainability here on the show is that a lot of newer generations and a lot of newer consumers, um, they're 
not so much curious, but they are looking for brands that are more so going green, um, implementing more sustainable practices. Would you say that it's helped you connect with younger generations or younger consumers? Yes, absolutely. And then would you say that that's something that you guys are like promoting on your socials? Is that also drawing newer consumers there? Yeah, we're just, we're, we're, uh, we're starting to do that. When we mm -hmm. first started our business, our whole, um, and it was very small at the time. We started out with, you know, five, you know, it was like maybe a 10 gallon extraction tank made out of an old beer keg. Um, okay. We had solar powered recirculation pump. The, my father's house was all solar powered back in, mm -hmm. in the early 80s. Uh, we, we set that up. So our whole system was all solar powered. And I think he would like to see that us get back to this whole operation being uh self you know self reliant wow yeah no that's that's great to hear that he's basically been green from the start and now you guys are now implementing that in the business what like 35 years later yep actually talking about retail stores um what would you say are yep. some of the big retail giants that you're in right now and then whenever you were entering those markets what would you say are some of your biggest challenges um um, well, well, one of the big ones we're in is uh, Whole, Foods, Whole Foods, and mm -hmm. one of the challenges there was um, we had to change some of the, the flavorings. We have different flavor coffees. Right. Um, had to get the flavor manufacturers to change formulas to be Whole Foods compliant. And now every all the other distributors are requiring the same things. Uh, we had to get non-GMO certification. Um, mm -hmm. we had, we had to take the propylene glycol out of the flavorings. That's all the flavorings have, have that in there. And mm -hmm. so we had to switch formulas to get rid of all of that, any kind of artificial, uh, flavorings. Um, and then with, uh, like Walmart requires that you have the third party audit done. So we hadn't had that until about maybe five or six years ago, um, right. they started requiring every company has to have a third party audit because they don't really trust the FDA and the local health departments to inspect your facility. Um, mm -hmm. It's more it's more about a, um, a traceability. Um, so if, let's say if you um, if you clean the clean the floors, it wasn't mm -hmm. done unless you document it. It's all about keeping records of everything that you did. And right. So they can and then, they come around and do an audit and make sure that we kept proper records of everything that we've done. And those mm -hmm. are all kind of challenges because, you know, when we were a lot smaller, we just, you know, we just knew what to do. We know how to clean everything and just do it. And but. Mm -hmm. Unless you wrote it down that you did that and signed off on it, it wasn't done. So that was kind of a challenge getting used to all the all the paperwork that's involved. So that takes yeah. a lot more time um, to do that. But, um, it, you know, it makes sure that everything's done properly. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's something that would be completely new to some of our smaller like businesses that we're working with, as well as some yeah. of our startup companies. I don't think that they realize how much work, um, not just so much like putting your product together, but then making sure that you're meeting all of these regulations that retail giants are asking mm -hmm. for. Also, the documentation process is something that's completely new to me. Um, mm -hmm. So that's, this is the first time that I'm hearing of it. Um, but what advice would you give to other aspiring entrepreneurs trying to innovate within like traditional industries? Hmm. <laughs> That's a good question. I mean, people ask me a, a lot of people that want to start up a new company and they have an idea hmm. and want to make, you know, potato chip dip or whatever they're doing. And they ask me what I think of, you know, I always tell them it's going to take a lot of time to get to, it's going to take a lot of time to make sure you're getting all the, getting it all right. And, um, and it takes a long time before you start making any profit off of it. So you got to be prepared mm -hmm. to not make any money for, you know, 
10 or 15 years even maybe. Right. Yeah, no, and you guys have now been in business for 35 years, so I can only imagine those first couple of years in business. We didn't make a profit for 20 years. We, right. We were self-sufficient. We weren't losing money, but we weren't making what I call a profit. We were, mm -hmm. you know, keeping people employed and making enough to get by and keep keeping the business operational. So it takes a long time before um, you got to be prepared to, to spend money and not get any return out of it for a long time. Right. There's no making it overnight. <laughs> what would you say are some of the biggest um, changes or what would you say are some of the biggest factors that helped you guys finally start turning profit aside from just keeping out the business? I think actually, I think that all of the, um, the competition that's developed over the last maybe 10, 10 years or so, all of the mm -hmm. the publicity that the cold brew coffee market has, um, you know, gotten with the news media and, and social media and all that, all of that has helped a lot. Um, right. It's just creating awareness to the general public about this, you know, this industry. Mm -hmm. I was just about to ask, how is it? Because you talk about competition and you talk about how it's bringing publicity. Um, what other ways would you say that you're leveraging competition to really bring the public attention to um, Cool Brew? Um, well, I think it's. I mean, it just happens on its own. The the um, the, the customer base that we have now, we have a lot of loyal mm -hmm. customers. They try other stuff. And they always come back and say, this is the best, uh, this is the best thing. I get emails every morning, like this morning, I opened an email from someone in New York, uh, they were in the Hamptons and they want to know how can they get it there? Cause they don't have a store in their area. So the customers are going out and finding new stores for us and mm -hmm. um, they're helping us to, uh, helping us grow. Right. Yeah. Um, and then lastly, Jeff, we just wanted to know if you have any more advice or any final words, um, anything that we didn't touch on that you want to talk about. I think, I think we've covered everything. I really, uh, yeah, I think we've covered it. Sounds great. And we're also glad to hear that you're very happy with the systems that we've provided. We're glad to hear that you're saving so much time, um, that you're able to focus on other areas of the business. We're also glad to hear that you're ink free now. Um, at least on your hands and not having to worry about that. <laughs> you know, I've, I've turned a lot of other people on to your products. Uh, of other people I know in the industry. Um, right. And hopefully they've gone and purchased from you. Yeah, no, we're, we're glad to hear it. Word of mouth um, advertising never goes it's out of style. It's def oh, yeah, no, definitely. And I can yeah. see that it's worked phenomenally for your company. Well, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Jeff, for joining us. We definitely enjoyed having you here on our podcast.